Good morning, Magic. I'm Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. And this weekend is pre-release weekend. What's that mean? Well, check out this epic trailer. My first time playing Magic was at a pre-release. It's just a really nice community that everyone kind of helps you out. You hear your name, grab a kit. Well, I really love that you get to play against a variety of players here. This is nice to share the excitement with close friends. Getting experience from the older players is really cool. It's been really fun so far. I love the art of this set. It's a really unique thing that Magic brings to the table. People want you to come and play. Just give it a try and people will help you out. It's just really cool getting to actually battle up against other opponents. I love the camaraderie of it. I think this is going to be pretty special. <laughs> Can you feel the hype? <laughs> uh, ahem. Anyway, a pre-release is where you get to play with the cards of a set for the first time. They can be available both as events to play in store or as take-home experiences, where you go to your local game store and grab a pre-release pack to bring home and play. Talk with your local store for more information on their pre-release events. But whether you're playing in store or heading home with one, these pre-release packs are really at the core of this experience. What's inside one? Take it away, Gavin's hands. Thanks, Gavin. All right, here we are. It's a Kamigawa Neon Dynasty pre-release pack. It looks like this. Let's crack it on open and see exactly what we get, and then we'll try building a deck. I'll kind of walk you through my thought process for building one. Um, you know, for a sealed deck, you want to get to 40 cards about 17 lands or so. So you got this little outer sleeve on it, like this, and this is what the inner looks like. Got that cool mech on the side, goes up like this, and you crack it open, a little bit of extra action happening in there. And here's what's inside. You're gonna get your six booster packs, count them six, which I'll set down right here. You also get a pre-release card, bam, which can be a rare or mythic from the set. Here is Shigeki, Jukai Visionary, with this 2022 stamp in the corner to indicate that it is the pre-release card. Had a lot of folks ask me why this new stamp. Kind of just we looked at the old stamp and there were uh, some challenges associated with it, especially as uh, dates for products slid around. So this is meant to create a kind of more unified um, unified thing for all of them that will not be worried about, uh-oh, the date moved and now it doesn't make sense for this card anymore. Definitely a lot of discussion on it. Random issue on the left or right side though. So if you have a preference, you can let me know in the comments down below. But you get this thing. So yeah, Rare Mythic from the set. Shigeki, Jukai Visionary is here. And then if I crack this open, I get a couple other fun goodies in here. There's what's on the other side of this, which I'm not going to show you, which is a code for MTG Arena. So uh, I got to save that code for myself, which gives me six uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty booster packs. And then also inside, you get some of these checklist cards, which is pretty cool. Tell me sure you can play your double face sagas. Additionally, inside you get this cool divider, pretty slick, very functional. This little guy, which on one side gives you some hints for how to build a pre-release deck. All this is also available on Daily MTG in my article, the pre-release primer, which is up right now. You can go check it out. And then the other side, just a cool little, uh, cool little poster of Kaito Shizuki. Pretty cool looking. And then last, but certainly not least, we get our spin down D20 with the set symbol right here in front. And then just rotates all the way down so you can easily start 20, take a damage, take a damage, just rotate it down. Makes it pretty easy. <clears throat> and hopefully you don't go to zero. But of course, most excitingly are these six packs. So I'm gonna crack them open and uh, we'll see what we get. I'll talk through what I'm thinking about as I'm cracking them open. Here. So usually what I do when I'm cracking open my packs is first I just, I know this is a little sacrilegious maybe. Some people want to look at everything. But the first thing I do is just open them all up right away. And I stack them on top of each other. Why is that? Well, the reason why is at a pre-release store, it lets them tr collect the trash quicker. Which I know is maybe a silly reason, but you know, it's really nice to be um, kind to your store and let them take care of everything on the, guard, on the table instead of having to come around multiple times to collect all the trash. So I just like to open them all up and stack them up like this. I know you're like, what are the rares, what are the rares? But this is how I do it. 
You don't have to do it that way though. You can look at the rest if you want. And then now I'll start kind of going to look through at all these, seeing what we got in here. So let's see if we've got any cool rares. Ooh, a Django, Seed of the Empire. Nice. That's one rare. Because your rares should not guide you too much, but I just can't resist, but look at what they are. Tamio, yes. Oh, amazing. Super cool. Okay. Well, I want to try and see if I can get this in my deck. That's cool. Uh, let's see. Up next, we got Satoru Umazawa. Oh man, this this is good. And a foil Kami War. Whoa, baby! People in the comments are gonna be like, "Your packs are loaded." I promise you, this is a totally random pre-release pack. No weird alterations or anything here. Wow, that is super super sweet. Uh, what else we got? We got uh, March of Burning Life. All right, all right. Hard to follow up what we've opened up so far. The Jungle Uprising, cool. We might, might have already crested on this pack, but it's still pretty darn sweet. And then uh, Weaver of Harmony and a Foil Sorry Captain. So that's pretty nice. So now um, now that I've seen my, my juicy rares, I just can't resist. I like to sort the cards into colors. Um, and the reason for doing that is it kind of just, just lets me look through my cards a little bit easier. And actually what I do, I don't do it one at a time. I go through and just search for all the cards in a color. So by basic lens, the basic lens, the checklist cards aside. So search for all the cards in one color because I just find it easier to uh, sort them out this way. You can do it's good for you, but just years of doing this has taught me that going through and finding all the ones of one color is faster than trying to separate them all out individually. But if you want to like read them, for example, as you sort them out, maybe uh, maybe that would be better for you. And by doing this, you kind of just start to see like what your uh, what your depth of each color is. Now it is worth noting that depth is not everything. Okay, so because you're going to play twenty three about twenty three spells and about 17 lands. So even if you only have like eight cards in a color, if all those cards in that color are good, you might still be totally fine. It might be a non-issue, but depth definitely is a hint toward, okay, you're gonna have enough to do here to make it worth to make it worth looking at. So let's sort these guys out. There's all the black cards. Okay, now onto blue. I just do it whatever order they show up in on the top of my stack, keeping, keeping it uh, interesting, you know. And you know, I'll no notice things as I go along. So things that I'm gonna be thinking about here after I sort all these out is when I basically look through all the stacks, I'm gonna try and figure out what my strongest cards are in each of the colors and how um, how many playable, exciting cards I have in those colors. Things you wanna look for, of course, are bombs, drugs, very strong rares. You, but you also wanna look for evasion and removal are two other really important things. Also, I think synergy is uh, pretty relevant as well. Uh, it's really, really important um, if you can do it, especially in sealed, to find cool synergies that you have. There's all those archetypes. You can check out my last video for all the draft archetypes of uh, Neo, and you can sometimes open those up in a sealed deck as well. And then finally, we're down to gold cards and artifacts, so I kind of just make some other stacks for these. The uh, gold cards, which we have quite a few of actually, kind of just go up here. A little reminder to me that they're hanging out. I gotta say that I will probably not be playing this five color Kami War, but it is pretty sweet to, to think about. Oh, it's so cool looking. Check that out. Oh, just awesome. All right, back to, back to the actual programming though. All right, now it is time to deck build. Let's see what we got and I'll walk you through it. All right, so now that they're all sorted out, I'm gonna start with white here and see what catches my what catches my eye in particular. Well, some good role player cards, like Spirit Companion is a fine cantrip role playing card. Vanishing Slash is our first removal spell that we find, so I'm gonna note that as relevant here. The Subduer, if you end up red-white, there's kind of this like little theme of attacking alone that's nice with this Imperial Subduer. Dragonfly Suit, you know, you got two cheap evasive flyers, which is nice. Okay, white does not look super hot to me. It's got one removal spell, but it's not splashable. It's got two white mana symbols in the corner, which makes it hard to splash. It does have these two dragonfly suits, which can be good as some cantrip creatures, but white looks a little bit on the weak end to me. So I'm gonna set that over here to the side for now. Let's go, go up and look at blue. Let's see if blue's uh, any juicier for us. Got this mech, which is good if we do go into vehicles. If we did go into white blue, which is the uh, vehicles color, this would help out, um, make sure we can mobilize those, uh, those three two flyers, which is nice. This card, I think, is actually probably going to be underrated initially. The fact that it just has flexibility early game as a counter spell or late game as a beater is pretty nice. And it's not like amazing or anything, but uh, it's a pretty weak. That thing is the reconfigure stuff is nice. Yeah, 
nothing here. This is good. The Skyson Report is really good. If you have enough artifacts, and we've got a decent number hiding out over here, this allows you to just loot a ton of times. Four mana, three through flyer is already a great limited card. And uh, the fact it's got this bonus on it is, is pretty pretty slick. Another counter spell. The Moonseer Hacker, I think, is also quite nice to be able to just uh, come in and draw a card into the Deep Hour style. Another Crab and Spell Pierce. Blue also looking a little on the weekend. Uh, not impossible that we play blue, um, but a little on the weekend. Let's take a look at black. Okay, I love the Dockside Chef. I think this is quite good, especially with tokens or just random trickety artifacts. In fact, you can cycle those is, is pretty, pretty nice. This is a four mana removal spell, so this is a great one to open up. Um, this card, I'm sure, will have lots of discussion around it in Limited. I, this card, I think, is just okay. Like, you have to base... Usually, you're going down. Not always. You can play, play like, one fours and stuff. But a lot of the times, you're going down a card to cast this in the first place. You're, like, chump blocking their creature, chump attacking. So, it doesn't actually... Um, it's not actually as bananas as it looks. Because we've got two Twisted Embraces, which is, are two pretty premium removal spells. Four mana, kill, uh, kill a creature, or Planeswalker, for that matter, is pretty pretty good already. This is pretty good if we have enchantments and artifacts running around, which we already have a bunch of enchantments. The energy blade is pretty nice. This card's just okay. The silencer is pretty good too. The scrounger is solid. This card, this card is all right. What's it on the backside again? Two, three, that gives you some mana for instant sorcery. It's okay. The blade bearer is really good. And this kind of a white black, we call it the balance archetype where you want an artifact and an enchantment. Wow, so many you are already dead. Three, you are already dead. That's funny. I might play one or two of this if I were to play black. Okay, black looking pretty good. White, blue, black. Time to go into red. Now, red is pretty short on cards, but maybe they'll be good. Let's see. We got Voltage Surge at the top, which is pretty strong. So it's, you know, a shock with upside, basically. That card's just okay, though. This card is also stellar, right? You can discard it to deal two damage somewhere, so it's like another another shock. Or more often, you'll play it for four mana to, you know, deal two to something. So that card's premium. Very good. Two Voltage Surge is very nice. Kindled Fury, a little on the weak side, though. Synthesizer is just okay. Oh, man, Kami's Flare is here, too. So we're, this is a very interesting situation where our red is pretty weak, but we do have four really good removal spells. So it's not impossible we might just splash red, um, but maybe we go black-red, you know, um, and, and go really removal heavy if we wanted to. But I think splashing red is the most likely scenario. It's a shame we didn't open up any of those tap lands uh, because that would have been really good if we got a, 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 a red tap land. All right, let's look at the our green here. This guy's a little two minute two two to start with. Pumps your enchantment creatures. Worth noting, I suppose. Enchantment matters thing. We don't, didn't get a lot of enchantment matters in white though, so it's usually the enchantment deck here. This thing is kind of just medium, medium. Yeah, that's not very good in limited. This card is great in limited though. Um, I, at four mana, it's a little unassuming as a four mana bite, but at six mana, it kills off two of their things, which is pretty strong. So that's that's a nice one to have around for sure. This card is also pretty nice. It's pretty much a counters among your stuff. It's good common. This is a four mana four four, so that's pretty nice. This card is a solid too, as a five mana four four that probably draws you a card when it comes into play. I love a good Kav Kavu Climber, and that one's nice here. An accelerator, a lot of cameo safekeepings. Okay, and then looking at our artifacts, just fl ear flagging anything that might be strong. There's a papercraft decoy, which is a, a fine filler, but nothing, nothing fantastic here. Yeah, these look pretty, pretty weak. And looking at gold cards, I never like to use gold cards in seal to totally guide my direction. But if well, now that I've seen everything, maybe it can help point me. My blue looks a little on the weak side, so I'm not super crazy about the Mechanaut. I also think I'm likely to just splash red, so maybe not on that one. The Uprising is a little risky and limited. Um, you know, you, you, you cast it, you attack with everything. I guess you can just play it as a R-dub, 2-2. Two, two. It's pretty funny. You can just play it as one R-dub. 2-2 two, two, Vigilance Menace Haste, because they don't get a token off that. Um, but yeah, kind of a funky card. There are, I think, two Asari Captains. Yeah, two Asari Captains. If we did want to go Red White Samurai, this is a great card for that archetype. The problem is we're a little light on red, uh, on red, and I feel like, what, we really only had one Samurai? Yeah, we, or we guess this, that, that's a Warrior, so that does count for this, the Aki Ember Keeper, which I have two of those. Um... Which is a two mana two, which is okay. And we have this one peerless samurai who is pretty medium. So I, I, the Asari captain is an option, but I kind of don't want to go down that direction. I just don't think we're going to have enough enough good stuff there. I think black is our strongest color. This is a, if I was trying to live a dream, I would I would play the common war, but not this time around. Gloom Shrieker, I think black green is actually a pretty plausible combination for us. This is also quite good with um, both of our enchantment removal spells. Gloom Shrieker, Shrieker can buy those back, which is really good. Currently, I'm leaning toward black, green, splash, red. 
And I'll let you know. This is if we went blueback, we would play. And then uh, unfortunately, we can't play Tamio if uh, if we go black, green, splash, red, which is a bummer because I would love to be able to play here. But uh, you know, sometimes a single bomb is not worth is not worth playing an entire color for. And she's strong, but she's certainly not unbeatable. Like you know, she's very good. If she comes down on on turn four and then limited, but she's kind of you know medium a little longer in the game. Gives you only a little bit of advantage. Satoru Umezawa is sol a solid. It's fine, but nothing like mind-bendingly amazing here. So I think I'm going to go green-black. Now let's go into the actual deck building portion. I'm going to try laying this out and see what we get. Okay, so here we are. Here's where I ended up, and I think it's actually kind of interesting. Now, I would definitely call this a bit of a don't do this at home if you can avoid it kind of deck. So um, I'll kind of run through why that is a little bit and why I'm taking a few risks here. But so where I ended up, I tried a lot of things out and did determine that I thought green-black was my strongest core. And here's why. Black just has two premium removal spells and these Twisted Embraces, four mana, kill anything, which is really nice. It also has this Dockside Chef, which is a great way to just cycle stuff away in the long game. Um, helps turn, you know, your chump blockers into just cantripping on their way out, which is really good. This Taguchi Silencer is another removal spell. You have to trade a creature card from your hand for their creature, but it should hit at least once and can even threaten to hit multiple times. Um, both of these, the Scrounger and the Blade Bluster, like this card is quite good for getting through. Death Touch Menace, especially if you hit both of them, is very strong. And the Scrounger can make a token or two to help fix your colors, which I will note being important here in a second. Um, and also this Gloom Shrieker is will kick off the black green section, I guess. Three mana for a two one that gets back a permanent is very nice, especially considering that two permanents in this deck are Twisted Embrace, which can uh, kill something right away. Those go in the graveyard. And also Twin Shot Sniper, you're liable to discard and want to bring back. And all kinds of other ways to get card advantages too. Uh, in green, this Spinning Wheel Kick is definitely a card that is appealing to me here. The, um, you know, dealing a bunch of damage to their creatures or even three if the game goes long enough is quite nice. Um, and then on two, we actually have a package of pretty strong two drops. This Shigeki, if you're looking to play a longer game, which this deck is, um, this is great for both accelerating you and then also um, channeling to get a ton of stuff back in the, in the late game. Uh, and then Coiling Stalker, like the Merge Keeper will, will, will ramp you. Coiling Stalker can just put counters on, on itself for the first time and then other creatures later on to grow your board. Um, this Weaver of Harmony is not super strong, but there are enough um, enchantment sources that I thought would be worth it. It's very good with the Gloom Shrieker, for example, to get two things back. Uh, you can double up on your, um, on your channeling uh, or the ETB trigger from the Jukai Preserver. You, also very importantly, you can double up on your Twisted Embraces. So, especially given it's a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two anyway that pumps up some of my creatures, I thought it was worth playing. The part where this deck gets a little, little sketchy is this Red Splash. I'm really missing any mana fixing for it. I could really use a Tap Land or even some kind of like a Greater Tanuki to search for lands. Um, the only way I have to fix my mana really is this Undercity Scrounger, which gives me a treasure. And I hope I get that thing active. But splashing four good removal spells in a sealed, which is often a slower format, made a lot of sense to me. So I am that's why I'm playing these. I'm going to play three mountains in my deck, with the premise being that I'm not going to need these until usually the mid-game anyway, and hopefully I can find a red source by then. It is definitely sketchy. Um, you know, people might tell you this is wrong to do. I wouldn't blame them. But I find that sealed often goes long enough that I do find it worthwhile to, you know, splash um, splash for removal spells in sealed, especially in a grindy slow deck like this. Um, you know, Shigeki also can kind of like, help you find red uh, mana sources by looking at your top cards and getting a land. A couple interesting things I'll, I'll note too. Faded to Antiquity, I believe, is a main deckable card here. Uh, a ton of artifacts and enchantments rolling around. You've got reconfigure creatures and enchantment creatures. So this card is quite nice, I think, actually, in this format. I don't know, don't know that I'd play like three, but main decking one usually seems pretty safe. 
Um, I'll note that uh, this Bosijos uh, reaches skyward is a nice way to just help um, help you hit your land drops. This is going to be a pretty mana hungry deck, I predict. Um, it doesn't look like it at its base, but especially with cards like Spinning Wheel Kick down here for the end game, stuff like Enormous Energy Blade, which is a, an equipment that you're going to want to mana sink it for to spend stuff on. Things like using Dockside sh uh, sh Chef and Sacking all requires mana. So this will give you some extra lands and then turn to a big creature to close out the game with. Um, why are my cards laid out like this? You might be wondering. Well, I like to lay my cards out in mana curve order. So you'll see that I have ones here on the left and my highest mana cost on the right with X spells all the way to the right. Um, but I have my, I separate them in two different ways. The, right, the cards on the top are ones that I intend to play on that turn. Cards on the bottom are cards I would likely not be playing on that turn most of the time. So for example, removal spells will go down here because I'm pretty unlikely to cast Voltage Surge on the first turn. Where Enormous Energy Blade is not a creature, but I still want to play it on turn three most most games. So, or I'm happy to play it on turn three at least. It can be a three drop. So it's going to be here on my three curve. That's why these cards are laid out this way. A couple other things I just want to call out. I did look at a black-white deck that used, um, you know, Banishing Slash, Jean Gossier of the Seed of the Empire, and, um, you know, a bunch of two drops. If you get these two drops, you get these two dragonfly suits, which are quite nice. A 3-2 flyer that's pretty easy to crew. You get these Imperial Subduers, which are pretty nice. The challenge I had is, first of all, if you play white, I don't think it lends itself well to splashing the red, especially wanting to try and um, hit this banishing slash on two. And I just want to make sure you can curve out and you want to be more of an aggressive strategy. So the, the splash removal works better if your deck is slower as opposed to if your deck is faster and trying to kill people quickly. Um... So that's one reason why I didn't want to do it. But also, I mean, while I got a bunch of cards, I wasn't excited about a lot of them. A lot of just two drops that are like, meh, I'm okay. Spirit of Companion, Cantrips. These have some minor effects before eventually transforming into, into creatures. Um, but really the, the best cards were like these two removal spells and a couple flyers and the two dragons fly suits. And I felt like the green black direction was going to be a little better for me. They're giving me a better curve with these two drops. Um, here, but also stuff in the late in the late game, as opposed to white, which was just like half a million two drops. Right, there's all five of these are two two drop creatures. You know, I, I think that's the other way I, I could see building this deck is black white um, instead of instead of green black splash red. It's also probably a little, little bit safer. So here's the white black deck I tried, and you see that the mana curve is just off, and the mana curve is a really important part of sealed deck building because I have a a lot of twos and a lot of three drops, but not much beyond that. And unless you're going to try and be hyper aggressive, you really, really want a mana curve that kind of curves into five drops and has some late game finishers somewhere, as opposed to just tons of two drops and tons of three drops. You can do it if your deck is really aggressive, but the kind of cards I have here are not necessarily the hyper aggressive ones. Two Spirited Companions, for example, do not lend themselves that well to aggression. I'm having to play one Papercraft Decoy here, which I'm going to want to spend mana if I trade it off to draw a card. These uh, Sagas will not become creatures until longer in the game. Um, I do have some fine aggressive cards on three. I've got two of the Imperial Subduers and two of the Dragonfly suits, but there's not enough to follow it up with. Additionally, I don't feel good about splashing the red in this deck because if I'm trying to be more aggressive, I don't have the time to go wait around to be able to cast my red spells. I need to be able to cast those cards right away. So even though a lot of the white cards look nice, the green cards just paired a lot better, created a better curve that had plays across the whole game and better finishers as well. You could play this deck. It would be totally fine. Um, but I, I would rather go with the black, green, splash, red deck. Yeah, I think there is a potentially good uh, black, white deck here, but I still have on black, green, splash, red. Maybe I would, I would get mana screwed or color screwed once and dislike it, but definitely this act of splashing, playing this extra color off a few lands is risky in sealed for sure. Um, so, you know, if you are uh, risk averse, maybe don't do it. But that's what's inside a Kamigawa Neon Dynasty pre-release pack and a quick look at building a sealed deck. Now, back to you, Gavin. I hope this was helpful to you. And if you have any questions or thoughts at all, please feel free to share them in the comments down below. I'd love to know if you enjoyed this kind of live sealed deck building. I'll talk with you again soon. And in the meantime, have fun getting ready for the pre-release. You got this, which helps you cast more enchantments and is one itself. Moving into the enemy color combinations, we have a fun one, black-white balance. No, it's not about somehow casting balance. It's about having both an artifact and an enchantment in play. Black-white doesn't side with artifacts or enchantments. It